Um, so, my name is Paul Ford. I'm, uh, a lot, people know me as a writer. I've actually been a consultant and programmer for many, many years, and I'm not a designer, so forgive me. Um, I am with a company called Postlight. I co-founded Postlight, and you almost definitely don't know about it because it's a month old, um, but we are a technology shop. We build big, beautiful technology things, which might be apps, might be web platforms, might be websites. We're a group of engineers, product managers, and designers, and we're growing very quickly. And so I'd love to hear from anybody. Uh, if you'd like to, please get in touch. So one of the things that's happened to me um, as I've made a, a transition from writer to agency co-founder is that I have to hire people and I have to hire the most talented people. That's sort of what I'm instructed to do in my role. And the question of, let's see if I can figure out which button, there we go. Uh, the question of, what, I have to hire people for uh, writing jobs and, oh, I've got to stay close to this, sorry, engineering, design, product management, other things. And there are other talents, obviously, out in the world, sciences, sculpture, photography, conceptual art, athletics, and fashion, which is a subject tonight. And it started to hit me as I was like, oh, I better go get some talented people that I had no internal model of what talent really is. And then I started to go out and look at the world and nobody does. It's actually one of these words that we use that kind of means nothing. And so I went and started to poke around. So the Oxford English Dictionary is, says that power is the ability of mind or body view to something divinely entrusted. That's key, God shows up a lot. Uh, <laughs> to a person for use and improvement considered either as one organic whole or as consisting of a number of distinct faculties. This is not useful for filtering resumes. The other one uh, that's big is another is the 10,000 hour rule. This was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers. Um, and the idea is that if you do something for 10,000 hours over the course of a, a set of time, you'll get really good at it, whether it's golfing or design or writing. And I love this and it's, it's great and it's sensible. Uh, there's been a lot of scientific studies and, and um, and reviews that have said that maybe this actually isn't as scientifically grounded as you'd hope, but the concept's interesting, right? But then it, it raises a question, which is, what will inspire you to spend that long on anything ever, right? If that is the end result of talent, the thing we're all supposed to be either developing ourselves or looking for, um, what would give you the, the reason to spend all that time? And then I started looking for corporate definitions and they all look like this. Like there's the talent crunch worsening and so on. And then there's a lot of these nine box grids to identify talented people. And like in the middle, there's, you know, that's a person who's supposed to develop on the top. They're always along the performance and potential axes. And there's lots of these, you'll find them all over. I love like, this is a person who is developing in the middle, the center. And this is a uh, solid citizen. Here. It's the same, same chart. Key contributor on the top left is somebody who is performing really well but just sucks in terms of potential. Star performers up there, so on and so forth. Solid citizen again, key contributor, but this one is broken into nine subgrids. I have no idea why and it's not explained. It's just, it's there. So if you want to get really granular about your talent, key player, consistent start, rough diamond on the top left, have to do a little better. Um, Enigma on the top left and core employee. So people have spent a lot of time saying the exact damn thing about the same damn thing about talent over and over again. Then I was like, all right, look, if they're gonna know about talent anywhere, it's gonna be Medium. There's gonna be a million posts. And I was totally right. There's like 5,000 posts on Medium about what talent is. And um, see what you see is like lots of light bulbs, lots of this, lots of people looking at clouds. That's a talent related thing. Uh, let's see, we got a few more, a lot of, yeah, kids with violins, that guy, <laughs> talent versus passion, talent's often in opposition. This message shows up, hard work, hard work matters a lot more than talent. You see that over and over and over again. Uh, a lot of people looking up at a camera related to talent. You might, might have seen a hundred of that, hundred of those, using LinkedIn, Estonian talent, looking at the beach, uh, the talent had often failed, the talent had need money. And then this, that tree, someone in, holding a tree in their hands is a big thing on Medium. Um, <laughs> I work with Medium, so I'm allowed to make fun of them a little bit. Then, 
I was like, all right, so that told me a little bit of something, told me the talent's really important. Then I was like, let's use Google image search because I actually think that's the one true search on the internet. It actually will tell you something. And so talent on the internet is according to, ego, uh, to, to Google search, if you search, it's just these did, there's like a whole culture of making these boxes out there. Like, I don't know if people make money or how it works, but if, if you ever figure it out, I want to know, like, is there like one company that's just doing these inspirational boxes? Because there's, um, if you've got talent, protect it. That's what Jim Carrey says is one of the quotes. So that's useful. Um, uh, more talent, less ego. And a lot of like, again, you're protecting your God-given talent and these go on and on and on and on. I'm telling you, man, this is the future of publishing right here is, is squares with inspirational crap in them. All right, so that wasn't that great. I, I still don't have an answer and I still have to hire, right? So talent is God-given, product of 10,000 hours. It's human capital, maybe the product of hard work. Products of genetics, that shows up a lot. People are a little awkward about that one. And um, my favorite is the product of maternal narcissism. If your mother uh, required constant affirmation, you might be talented. That's from a book in the 60s, very Freudian. So a lot of theories about what makes a talented person. Oh, quick reading. This is all from a, a book in progress. So I wanna write about a manage, I wanna, I wrote about a management technique this is a trick I've learned from managing projects. I've shared it with other managers and they've reported back that sure, it works just fine. Let's say you're working with a graphic designer, a good one, a talented one. You need them to design something for you, a web page or a graphic that goes on a web page. I'm sorry, the designer says, it's just gonna be late. I have other projects, I have other responsibilities and it's complicated and there are exigencies and my cat died and I can't focus. And my children and my health condition, you can't force it and there's a research phase. I'm waiting to hear back from the photographer. I need the real copy, I need the branding guide. They changed Photoshop, I'm waiting on books to arrive and the grid system is off and we need to consider how it's gonna work on mobile. And my wife has the flu and purple's wrong. I'm waiting for Time Warner to fix my cable modem. I thought I'd be able to work in an open plan office, but I can't. There's a tremendous amount of noise. The light has a reddish tint. My headphones sound tinny in one ear and it's throwing me off. My chair has a leftward tilt and it's causing all of my designs to trend leftwards and my fiance has rickets. My marriage is failing. I should never have said yes to this because I should have known that I would create only more emptiness and vacuum in the world for I am history's worst design monster. I am the reason that nothing is good. I've created only failure everywhere I go. I'm a machine that eats Pocky and excretes despair. <laughs> but if I could have another week, I'll get it for you. So here's what you do. You open up the lousiest program you have. PowerPoint's actually a great example. And don't think much. Just do the design for the designer, assuming you're not a designer. Do it without shame and do the absolute best you can and email it with these words. I know you're under a lot of pressure, but if you could just give me a few minutes of feedback, I'll do my best to get it done. Now this will generate the desired effect. The designer will immediately switch from a state of total despair and shame into one of complete panicked revulsion and nausea for which the only possible cure is to take the horrible atrocity, the offense, to taste and form that you have produced and sit down huffing, throbbing in the corner of her eye like a coming migraine and do the work that you asked her to do 45 days ago in about six hours. At the end of which will come a state of calm rapture and a sort of amnesia, the entire span of time during which things, uh, the entire span of time during which nothing was getting done suddenly chalked up to quote the process, end quote. And you've solved two problems. You got the work done so that you can move forward with your own responsibilities and you gave the talented person a sense of superiority and relief from her own fear of failure. That's the nature of talent. One sits around terrified to get started for fear of failing until the risk that someone else will do the work incorrectly sends one into such a state of frustration, annoyance, and jealousy that it gets done. Thank you. So I'm gonna take a very tiny uh, left turn because I realized as I was thinking a lot about talent that it's actually, into, it, it, it's very closely related to issues of form. 
And by form, what I mean is a well-understood set of constraints. This is a, these are the different sizes of paper, A, B, C, D, and, you know, letter, tabloid. Forms define novels, books, short stories, sitcoms, movies, keynote presentations like this one, apps, web pages, consumer software, and apple pies. And I actually encourage everyone to go out and look for apple pie contests on the internet. They're like this, they're in Comic Sans, but they are freaking serious. Here's one where it's, I love this one has an FAQ, are nuts allowed? Yes, all nuts are allowed. How about bacon? And you're like, shut up, internet. You know that they started getting that question. And they're like, yeah, of course. Okay, fine. If Apple's the player, it's fine. Just put your freaking bacon in the, in the pie. So the perfect pie is 10% judged on appearance, 40% judged on crust and filling, 50% on overall flavor and taste. These are actually somewhat universal. Like I, every time I look at a pie contest, I see these numbers that are similar to this one. So there's a percentage breakdown that indicates the perfect apple pie. This goes back a ways. This is from 1381, and it's a, it's a recipe for apple tarts. And the recipe is take good apples and good spices and figgies and raisins and pears. And when they're well abraded, colored with saffron well, and do it in a coffin and forth to bake well. So that's it. People have been thinking about apple pie since at least 1381. There have been rituals and rules uh, for creating a good apple pie in all that time. This is a quote, I have this in literally every deck, no matter what I do, it just keeps coming back to me. A uh, great socialist artist in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s in, in Britain, a guy named William Morris, and he was talking about typewriting and how he preferred to work with a uh, uh, quill pen. And he just said, you can't have art without resistance in the materials. And that's, when we talk about constraints and form, that's what it is. It's the edge of the paper. It's the fact that a novel can only be so long or a short story can be so long. There's resistance in the materials that we work with. Like this, and I love this. This is resistance in the materials, right? There, no one's gonna drink. On the bottom left, there's a cat leaping out of one coffee cup to get into another coffee cup where there are fish. Like this is not for drinking, right? But they're working backwards from the form and they're figuring out ways to expand and, and deal with it. And actually on the top right, you'll see there's, a, there's like a dot matrix um, coffee output, right? And so computers are getting in and, and, and ruining things for everybody, even in the world of, of latte art. Um, another quote, no artist is pleased. There is no satisfaction whatever at any time. There's only a queer divine dissatisfaction, a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than the others. That's Martha Graham. One more quote, for the first couple years, you make stuff, this is Ira Glass. It's just not that good. I want to do it in his, act, in his voice. It's trying to be good. It has potential, but it's not. But your taste, it's a key word, the thing that got you into the game is still killer. And your taste is why your work disappoints you. A lot of people never get past this phase. They quit. Most people I know who do interesting creative work went through years of this, and we know our work doesn't have this special thing that we want it to have. I know I shouldn't read quotes, but it's important. This is, there's a message here. So I think I started to break it down and I wrote this down. Talent is the demonstrated ability of an individual when they perceive errors of form to take specific actions to correct those errors or more uh, obviously, talent is what annoys you. When you talk to, when you think about your own reaction, when you see a screwed up grid, grid system, have you ever talked to talented people, watch their like, their hand shaking or they're like, they call it, my, my friends call this the third Bates coach. Like it's just like this very, there's a set of nervous reactions that we have when we are faced with substandard work. And almost everyone who was on stage here today actually spoke about that in various forms, like spoke about the frustration and going further and trying to finish uh, and, and make sure that things are complete and good and of exceptional quality. Um, there are countless reference works that define forms and define how to be good. These are things that tell us, that's the weblog handbook, screenplays, these tell us how to be annoyed with things. They tell us what to worry about, what to freak out about, how to make things good. And we get very proactive and positive about the idea of talent, but the reality is like, when you're experiencing it, you're under deadline and you're frustrated and you are genuinely annoyed that something, that you've let it get this bad, that someone else has let it get this bad, and you have to make, you have to, you have to take efforts to fix it. And that's where your 10,000 hours is gonna come from. How to read a book, how to paint like the old masters, how to make computer programs, white space is not your enemy, journalistic writing, Chicago manual style, all of these are guides to form. 
this too also defines form. This is the Tumblr interface. And this one in particular, get to 140 characters and it starts to flash red and tell you that you've had enough. So what are the things, as I'm trying to apply this, when I'm hiring writers, I'm looking for, pe for people who are pissed off about bad paragraphs or lazy endings. When I'm talking to engineers, I'm looking for them to be upset that it's running slow or that the code is poorly structured. These are aesthetic concerns as much as they are technological, um, that there's no test. You know, you listen for things like, this could be better. Design, um, lack of that grid, right? Or an ability to really understand what the system or framework is underneath. Lazy color choices, bad type. And as, as uh, the gentleman from Refinery29 was saying, like there is a, uh, there's a branding, ethos that keeps their organization moving forward. You know, they, they cultivate this sense of anxiety in their people, although I doubt they would put it in that way. Um, product management, same thing. No clear user, broken user flows, useless MVP. These are the things that bug the hell out of the people in our world. And increasingly, as I've been talking to people about coming and working with me, I'm sending them an email going like, what annoys you? And I'll, get a, I'll often get a good paragraph or two back. like. Uh, one designer was really upset when anyone does manual labor that could be automated. And I was like, that's a powerful indicator, actually. If, that, if that's something that keeps you up at night, you might really do well. People take forms very, very seriously. They put them on their bodies. This one, I'm like a little worried now that Creative Cloud is out. It's pictures from... <laughs> pictures from a couple years ago, but this goes deep for us. We get internalized these forums, we care about them very much, we get very anxious when things aren't right, we want them to be better, it's what makes us fun and sometimes incredibly insufferable to be around. Um, whoops, I don't know what that influencer is, but one of the points I like to make is that Different cultures um, align their talents and, and come together in certain ways. And I've noticed that San Francisco and the Bay Area are really good at making boxes uh, and New York City is really good at filling them in. Different kinds of networks, different kinds of talents. And um, right now the money is in making the boxes. So that's a little tricky and we all have to figure that out. So that's all I got. Talent is what annoys you. Thank you for your attention. I welcome any questions, or you guys could just go downstairs and have a cocktail. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, who's going to ruin it? <laughs> oh. uh, I have two two part question. Did it take you 10,000 hours to write what is code? Oh God, <laughs> it took me about five or 600 hours, I think, and it's kind of coming out of a book, that, that thing was, tricky. Um, so for those who don't know, I wrote an entire double issue of Business Week to explain what programming is called What is Code? And um, I sent it in at like 10,000 words. It was supposed to be 6,000. And they were like, come into the office. <laughs> and uh, I actually just didn't get to leave for like three or four weeks. I just sat there and kept typing and cutting and pasting things. You start to find stuff you've written in notes files when they're like, yeah, we're going to give you the whole issue. You're like, oh, shit, maybe this, okay. And you just start throwing everything you can into the bucket um, and then counting on your editors to keep you from making an idiot of yourself. Quick question. So what was it here? Ah. What was it that annoyed you enough to start your own company, agency? Uh, two things. I have a set of products that I really need to see shipped in order to feel good about the world I'm in. And um, it, I, it occurred to me that I've been doing too much work by myself and I needed a community around me. And I had a friend who'd been talking with me about starting an agency for a while. And so, uh, part of it is just that, like I just, there's a gap I see in the world of uh, the ways that people communicate and then the ways that people are using the web and I want to be in a position to resolve that and I can't do it. I've taught myself how to do a lot of things. I can't teach myself how to build and ship software at that scale. I need help. So that's a selfish reason. The larger reason is, um, I don't know, I've been at this for a while and I like, I really, 
like horrible problems. I like the satisfaction of it. I like going out and talking to people and getting lunch and getting coffee and just working through whatever mess they found themselves in. And knowing that those problems are out there kind of makes me happy and I want to get to those problems. I can't wait to. So it's that sense, it's two things. It's like a sense of, I want to build the web that and the, the digital world that I want to see and I want to make, I want to help other people resolve their terrible tensions. That's very satisfying to me. Uh, back to uh, uh, hi. Uh, back to ah. what is code. Uh, the interactive version online, uh, all the code snippets and uh, uh, everything that surrounds the text. Was it part of what is code, or was it added later by Bloomberg? And like, if it's part of the original, what is code? Who made it? Who wrote it? Uh, it's it's a comp. I mean. That was me and 50 really nice people who got that done. Um, the code snippets started as a group effort, including me. And then what happened is when they decided it would, the, I would be writing the whole magazine, it became clear that we were going to have to slightly split up, split up responsibilities. And, uh, and so there's a tech team. Um, with some just brilliant and hilarious people on it. And they split off, started working on animations, and we would check in. I went to all the stand-ups. Um, I checked in some of the initial code for the tutorials and, and some of the more dynamic stuff. But at about two weeks before launch, I was out of it, and it was really on them. Your uh, definition of talent in terms of you put into employment, it doesn't take into account um, experience or proficiency. So I'm curious, what kind of training do you do to account for that? Oh, I think it really does, though. I think, I'm, I mean, obviously I'm oversimplifying, but like, you cultivate annoyance throughout the course of your career. When you work with somebody who's an exceptionally gifted person, by the time they are like 20 years in, Oh my God, like they're seeing things that uh, someone much younger could never see. And if you can, if you can deal with them, because often they're a little narcissistic and crazy, go stand next to them because they're the ones who are going to give you, you can steal their perception. But I would say that, no, absolutely, over time you learn to be more and more annoyed. And often I think, like I try to, I try to cover up how annoyed I am. If anyone actually got a full edit from me, like people would be like, hey, can you help me with this writing? And I'm like, yeah, but okay. And then I just like, I take a step back because if I gave them the edit I give myself, they would not have, they wouldn't want to have any friends left in the world. It wouldn't just be like, they'd be upset with me. They just fucking hate everything, right? Because I will brutalize a piece of prose. I will brutalize a, an app. I cannot articulate enough like so and I think there's a lot of people in this room who have a sort of suppressed frustration and exhaustion when they see those errors of form and that just gets more and more profound as you watch people reinvent the mistakes of the last 10 years um, I'm seeing it now where everybody's rebuilding you know everything that was done in the 70s in JavaScript and creating interfaces that had been worked out in 1972 except that now there's a hundred million people using them instead of 50 people um, so if that answers your question. Hi. Um, sorry, up here. Oh, hey, uh, thank you. Uh, that was really great. And uh, the annoyance uh, was a great simplification. Uh, one simplification I was wondering if you could speak to is how you uh, bucket them into job roles. Uh, someone like me and I think someone like you have annoyances that span across those different different job titles, and I'm curious if you can speak to talent at that level and how you diagnose it. It's terrible, <laughs> right? Because the, the talents that we get most excited about in the, in the world are the ones that really align closely with the needs of global capitalism at this exact moment. Like, like we're, everyone's really into like engineering talent because there happens to be a paucity of engineers and uh, the market demand for them exceeds the supply. And so we're very into that. The same with design and product management. I think that people who can do more than one thing and are obsessed with more than one thing, I, I, for me, I'm obsessed with the relationship between narrative form and technology. And I have never been not obsessed with that. I've been obsessed with that since I was 12. I would be obsessed with it if there was no internet, particularly right now. It's just weird that it kind of all aligned. But I think in general, if you have more than one skill, you should probably, depends, if you want, if, 
if you can't help yourself, you're just going to pursue it endlessly anyway. Like, I, there's a lot of people come to me for mentoring, and they'll be like, hey, I really love this thing, and I love it more than anything else. Should I go be in, you know, should I go work in agencies, or should I go do this or do that? And I'm like, you're just going to do this over and over again. Like, until you can resolve that internal tension that defines you, um, you're not going to be able to go be happy as, like, getting some JavaScript skills and doing front-end web design or whatever. So. Um, I think at some level, people who are obsessed across disciplines are just going to have to make peace with it and then give it 10 or 15 years. All right. So uh, I think that's all the time we have. But uh, thank you very much. That was great. Thanks.